This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to a special half hour edition of Here and Now on this long weekend. Right to our top story, the search for a missing hunter in central Newfoundland is over. Four men were crossing a bridge Saturday evening when their truck slipped and plunged into the frigid river below. Three men got out safely and sadly, until late this afternoon, there was still some hope for one of the men who wasn't found. Here now's Jeremy Eaton traveled to the town of Terranova and has this report. This overturned pickup was at the center of the search, one that didn't have a happy ending. The RCMP confirmed late this afternoon that the body of a missing man had been recovered. Keith Dix and Paul Hiscock were in the area Sunday morning when they saw something in the water and decided to take some pictures. So there's something in the water there, like a canoe or something. And yeah, there was a to the comb a pickup truck. And well, obviously now it's someone's after losing their life there. The trouble started on this bridge when four men in the red pickup truck tried to cross it with not much room to spare. A wooden bridge and there's no rails on the side of it. And uh, the night they went off it now was, uh, was snow on it. I guess they slipped and went over the edge. Huh? The accident happened just outside of the town of Terra Nova. To get there, you have to cross this woods road, which isn't flat or very forgiving. The RCMP used ATVs to get close to the scene and got help from a helicopter and the Bonavista Bay search and rescue team. When we were on the road, we didn't know there was anyone in the country. But when we crossed over the bridge, they're all there in the cabin. There was a police officer there, and I guess there were 10 or 12 people there, wasn't it? The three other men in this pickup truck got out safely. Two of them were taken to hospital as a precautionary measure. The RCMP says it's not releasing the victim's name at this time. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, near the town of Terra Nova. Now, this was the scene just outside Gambo on Saturday afternoon. A pickup truck collided with a side-by-side -side ATV on the Trans-Canada Highway, five kilometers outside of town. One person on the ATV was taken to hospital. There's no word on how badly that person was hurt or what caused the crash. The head of MAD Canada says the best way to prevent impaired driving deaths on ATVs and snowmobiles is to make stronger laws. A CBC investigation found that 44% of all ATV and snowmobile deaths in Atlantic Canada since 2012 involved drugs or alcohol. Here in this province, more than one in five deaths involved intoxication. Andrew Murray says BC's move to impound a drunk driver's car for three days has cut impaired driving deaths by 50% in that province, and he believes the same strategy would work for snowmobiles and ATVs. And that's why it works on the roadways, because the next morning they can't go anywhere with it. And the same would apply for, um, you know, their recreational vehicle. They can't participate in their activity. Uh, they have to pay the high rate to get it back. They're charged with impaired driving. They have a criminal record. All those things that have worked with cars, they'll absolutely work with other vehicles as well. Now, tomorrow, the province plans to bring in new legislation to discourage the sharing of non-consensual nude or explicit pictures. It will give victims of so-called revenge porn the right to launch a lawsuit against a person who posts that kind of material. There have been a number of criminal cases of revenge porn over the past year, and a local lawyer says with social media, it's become a big issue. And back in April, I spoke with one such victim who strongly supports what the government intends to launch tomorrow, and we agreed to protect her identity. I think it's going to be great because it's really going to show people that like you can't do this and get away with it. There's nothing to gain from posting a picture of someone nude online just because they did you wrong or as revenge porn is what everyone's calling it. Like right. there's, there's no need of it. Now that I'm older, I'm definitely like, I don't know why I would have sent it in the first place, but like I, I do know why I did because I know that the guy I was, I was with, I felt like I had to send it to him in order to make him feel like I wanted to be with him. Now, the province's Justice Department will unveil its legislative proposals to combat revenge porn tomorrow. A Lewisport woman hopes that social media is going to help her locate family members who are missing in the California wildfires. Megan Janes says her uncle Randy Dodge and his wife Paula have been missing now for four days. They live in the town of Paradise in Northern California, an area that wildfires have devastated. Statewide, the fires have claimed 31 lives and 228 people are still unaccounted for. 
Jane says she and her family feel helpless and she hopes her social media posts might lead to some clues about where her aunt and uncle are. His house is burnt down. There is no bodies found, but his vehicles are there. Hoping for the best, and I need to hope for the best. And I haven't heard anything yet. I've heard nothing. Social media has powers. It's just really touching to see a whole world connect over trying to help find missing people. I have called all the shelters. I've called the sheriff's department in the area, the Red Cross. I've also checked the missing list all the time. We have tried every single avenue. In Happy Valley Goose Bay this weekend, members of the RCMP and the Royal Canadian Air Force stood in the snow, bowing their heads before the war memorial. 69 wreaths were laid to remember the fallen and to mark the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. And here on the Avalon, hundreds gathered on the windy streets of downtown St. John's. Hey, my name is Raymond Reiser, and I'm in the uh, I'm in the American Legion Post CN09 that's here in St. John's. I'm laying a wreath for uh, for for our fallen soldiers, and uh, also uh, my father-in-law was uh, Larry Field. He was number 153 Blue Putty back in World War One, and I I do it for him also. So it's great for us to remember, even though we know peace did not last for 100 years since the First World War, at least at that day, peace was, and they were happy and joyful and grateful that the war was finally over. He taught them everything that he know be, being in, in the country. Friends and family pay tribute to Innu leader and elder this Shimon Michel, who died last month at 103. It is. And here's the view from our rooftop camera. I'll tell you what weather is on the way coming up in a little bit.
Welcome back. In Con River, an eagle feather is a great gift, and it's also a great responsibility. Feathers are prominent at powwow and ceremonies, and as here and now's Garrett Barry reports, those feathers are much more than mere decorations. This is the golden eagle feather that was gifted to me, and it came with some blue jay, and this is connected to my to my head roach as, as a, a drop. You have to make sure everything is secured because the one thing you don't want to do is, is drop an eagle feather sure. until that eagle may 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 have died it's probably the first time that those feathers touch the ground i mean i've, I've seen people i've seen dancers weep when they drop feathers we, we we know how sacred this this uh this gift is you know we know how sacred uh, the eagle the kipu is and uh, you know we have to uh I always be aware of that. Red, by the way, is the sacred color. So, uh, my my knowledge of, of our our history and our culture, the eagle and the eagle feathers have always played an enormous part in our in our in our spirituality, our culture. Um, you know, we've been told that the eagle itself is the only bird that ever touched the face of the Creator. So, eagle feathers are sacred. Sometimes the feathers get dry. And my forehead now is a good time to uh, oil them a little bit. You know, I, I wished I had a, a bustle. I didn't know how I would get a bustle. I knew a guy who had a bustle and stopped dancing, and I and I hounded him. Titters are given to people that earn them. They're not readily passed out to anyone. Uh, you may know someone, respect someone, and know that they've done good work in your life and, and respect other people. Uh, those are people that you give fitters to. I've been dancing for for over 20 years, not with feathers, but uh, I guess after showing my dedication at uh, with dancing, I was gifted eagles and uh, by Michelle Joe, and uh, I, ma I made my own bustles. Uh, you know, if if you're true to your culture, uh, true to Mi'kmaq ways, and you're being respectful to to yourself and people around you, respectful to people in the community, respectful to elders. Um, yeah, you, you don't have to wait years and years and years to get a fitter. I mean, to be gifted a, an eagle and to make, create my own bustle was, was, you know, incredible, you know. Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. <laughs> Okay, we'll get to the weather in a bit. As you can tell, this is not Debbie Cooper. That's, uh, <laughs> we're just sort of solo tonight. Debbie back tomorrow. We'll get to the weather in a second. Now, earlier we saw that this weekend's windy weather didn't keep people away from those Remembrance Day ceremonies in downtown St. John's, nor in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Yeah, and it was the same in Burgio. Hail and high winds couldn't keep the crowds away. Take a look. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard. So we had local groups like the Rangers, the Kinsmen Club, and the Volunteer Firefighters. They laid wreaths, as you see there, in the center of town. So what was it like there? Was it yeah, a bit was, windy? It was a little bit Tad. windy. Yeah, and we haven't really seen uh, much relief in that way either. Mm -hmm. We're still looking at uh, windy conditions right across uh, most of the island today as well. Right. So we'll get to that wind. It's actually good to see uh, and a reminder that uh, the Remembrance Day ceremonies, of course, happen all over the province, uh, not just this side of the overpass. So <laughs> nice to see uh, beautiful Burgio over the weekend. Okay, so what are we looking at? Well, temperature is a little bit of a chill in the air, we've noticed. I don't know if you've noticed, but yeah. outside with that wind. Couldn't find my slippers this morning. <laughs> yeah. My feet are blue. I'll, yeah. I'll show you after. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're going to need those slippers uh, at least through most of this uh, week. It looks like these temperatures mm. are going to continue. Uh, highs today sitting in the single digits for the most part across the island and then cooler up through Labrador, minus 7 in Lab City today. Those temperatures have since dropped down to about minus 9, and we're seeing temperatures get closer and closer to the zero degree mark as we head uh, into the overnight tonight. And it's that northwest flow that we're seeing right now 
uh, with windy conditions. So winds also the story. Top gusts so far, 96 in Bonavista. We're seeing uh, a number of gusts upwards of between 70 and 80 kilometers per hour, especially along the coast, Labrador coast as well. Now the winds have since eased a little bit, but they're going to stay quite strong as we head through the night tonight. We're looking at gusts uh, upwards of about 60 uh, along the west coast to about uh, 50 to 70 kilometers per hour for parts of the east. And uh, in that onshore flow, we're seeing some flurry activity. So we could pick up a couple centimeters for uh, the west coast. Otherwise, that's slight chance of a few flurries, but then we should see some clearing out of ahead of the next system that moves in. And with that, we're going to see some windy conditions as well. So already seeing those wind warnings along the west coast and a wreck house warning in place. Otherwise, it's a special weather statement, and that's because that system is going to move in. And with this gust quite strong. So those winds are going to pick up as we head uh, into the overnight Tuesday into Wednesday and then shift. So uh, starting in the southwest and then continue to spread east as we head through the day on Wednesday, uh, including up along the, the coast of Labrador as well. Gusts upwards of about 80 kilometers per hour for Cartwright, but you can see uh, widespread gusts between 100 and even 130 kilometers by the time Thursday morning rolls around. And that's the story right across the island. And with this, we're going to see some strong uh, or with the snow, I'm rather we're going to see some blowing snow into the afternoon on Thursday as well for parts of Labrador. Things will eventually ease Friday morning, but then another system moves in and those winds are going to pick right back up uh, on, into Saturday and then continuing into Sunday for the most part. So here's a look at the forecast for tomorrow. Those temperatures much cooler sitting in the single digits. One degree for Corner Brook. Three degrees should be the afternoon high in St. John's. Most of the day will be a mix of sun and cloud and then we'll start to see that system roll in and with that it's going to start as snow uh, for the southwest spreading east. Now, parts of the Buren and the southern Avalon will likely see that start as rain change over to snow and then back over to uh, snow into the afternoon on Wednesday. And then we can see that uh, onshore flow means we're going to see some pretty significant snowfall and that will continue Wednesday even into Thursday. So accumulations before that changes over to rain. We're going to see somewhere between 10 to 15 centimeters, possibly uh, interior. That's the same there, but then uh, parts of central we will see close to 10 centimeters just before that rain hits. And then we could see some more snow heading in uh, Wednesday night into Thursday. So this could be a significant snowfall event for parts of uh, the island. Well, thanks, Ashley. Now, last week we told you about the death of Shamoon Michel. He was 103 years old when he passed away on the 30th day of October. He was a revered elder of the Innu Nation. Our Jacob Barker met with his family to learn more about Michel and the long life that he led. At 103 years old, Shimun Michel saw the Innu through some big changes. He was born on the land, lived in a tent, and saw the Innu through their transition into settlements. Shimun was one of the first Innu, probably to retire from the government. He worked with the Department of Highways, and I can remember my uncle uh, sanding the road from, from Northwest or from Sissy to Goose Bay in the shovel. You know, that's a lot of work. Francis Snow, Shimun's daughter, says traditional activity and language was important for him to pass on. He taught um, youth about live, being in the country, and he taught the leaders, really, a lot of knowledge that he left, like he teach them the, the names of uh, the land. He taught them everything that he know be, being in, in the country. She says her father was spiritual, a devout Christian, but also in the beliefs of the Innu people, a shaman and a medicine man, also known for his drumming. He was a master of the drum. He goes to different uh, places to do the ceremonies when he's invited, especially at the age of uh, the last drum he did was 100, 102. He was instrumental in land claims negotiations, mapping out territories submitted to the federal government. There were at that time somewhere in the vicinity of probably 50, 60 elders on the floor, pinpointing areas where they, tra where they traveled, where their kids were born, or where the burial sites were and, and who was born where and so on. It was a very interesting uh, project for the Inu to undertake. And Simon was very instrumental. This piece of land that we're in is not Canada. 
It is in our territory. He was also a big part of protests over the years. He fought against low-level flying by the military in the area in the 1990s, arguing it disturbed the caribou and wildlife. His presence was a symbolic presence in my mind to be peaceful, not to have a physical confrontational movement with the so-called authorities. But while he's remembered for being an elder and a leader, he's also being remembered for his life as a family man. He had 12 children of his own, and the generations continue. He had 53 grandchildren and 103 great-great-great-grandchildren. A large family and community that will sorely, sorely miss their leader and elder. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Sheheji. The results of a new study into how well babies sleep at night will likely let some parents rest a little bit easier. CBC Health reporter Christine Birak explains. Here you go. <gasps> Oscar's bedtime is pretty routine. They brush and brush and brush their teeth. A quick read and it's lights out for this nine-month-old. For many new parents, a full night's sleep is the dream. 
but a peek inside shows Oscar has other plans. For months, this was his parents' world. He was waking up every hour or two throughout the night. Just as being an adult, I know that if I don't sleep very well, I definitely don't function as well as I do when I sleep, so how could that not affect a developing brain? A new study suggests it doesn't. Canadian researchers followed about 400 moms and their babies for at least three years. They found at six months old, about a third of babies weren't sleeping six straight hours a night. At 12 months, about half were not sleeping eight consecutive hours a night. Researchers then tested each child's cognitive, language and motor development. We were not able to find any uh, negative outcomes related to sleeping or not through the night. Either way, you're not messing up your kid. Pediatricians often recommend infants be trained by about six months old to sleep through the night. But this doctor insists it's just training. guidance, not a rule. And to parents here, if you don't sleep train your baby, you're going to be a bad mother. If you don't sleep train your baby, you're going to screw up your kids. Um, and I don't know if we appreciate as much as we should the way our messaging is interpreted by parents. If social media is any indication, they're desperate, and not just for the baby's sake. But teaching your infant how to fall asleep and stay asleep can be controversial. I just wasn't comfortable with like a true cry it out. Oscar's mom ended up hiring a sleep trainer, and a little crying worked. This is a great study to alleviate some of that concern and anxiousness that they're not doing right by their children or their bad parents that their children aren't sleeping. Moms need their sleep too. Researchers said it didn't necessarily put them in a bad mood if their sleep was broken up, as long as they somehow got six to eight hours. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Cute little baby. Now, next week, you'll have a new $10 banknote in your wallet, and it's one that features the face of a civil rights pioneer and businesswoman from Nova Scotia. Viola Desmond will be the first Canadian woman featured on a regularly circulating banknote. This, more than 72 years after she was ousted from the whites only section of a movie theater in New Glasgow. The new bill will also feature a map of Halifax's historic North End. That's home to one of Canada's oldest black communities and the site where Desmond opened her very first salon. Desmond's portrait will be placed on the bill vertically. That's another first. The idea was to set it apart from all of the other bills. That's fabulous. <laughs> That's very nice. That's nice. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we're just a half hour show tonight. Uh, we'll have Land and See a really good episode, an encore performance for you. But first, we've got some picture stuff to deal with. We do. And first, I want to show you uh, quickly the ah. picture from on Friday. This was sent in by Karen Brinson from Burgio, uh, Newfoundland. Thank you so much for sending in That's that. That's the one that I karmically <laughs> guessed did. from the rooms on Friday, if you're you recall. Just, you're just so good. And you know, I've been on that lookout, and this is a beautiful picture, Karen, but it's one of those lookouts where you could actually do a panoramic 360. So there's your challenge, Karen. <laughs> Go up there and do the little pirouette with your camera and give us a 360 from Burgio. That is an absolutely gorgeous spot and a gorgeous shot and beautiful Burgio. That's right. Now, this one a little bit oh, more noticeable. Okay. This is today's uh, weather photo. Is this close to St. John's? It sure is. It's close to St. John's, right? Oh yeah. Oh, it's not motion, is it? No. No. Uh, <laughs> is it Torbayish? No. Okay, I give up. Cape Spear. Oh my. How do you not goodness. recognize that? Uh, it, that's too easy. That was such a good that's photo. It. <laughs> that's... I took my parents there this weekend. Uh huh. And did you take that? No, I didn't take okay. this. This was sent in by Ann Madden, but as soon as I saw it, it was a windy day. The ocean yeah. was a little so bit how, angry, and it was beautiful. Right. Now, you brought your parents in. They watched the show a couple times. They did. Was this their first time to Newfoundland or not? Uh, no, they've been, they've before? been okay. before, but never. Mm -hmm. they've never actually seen me do my job. Yeah, <laughs> so you... <laughs> Which is funny. They didn't come here to see you do your job. No. I understand there was a pub or two involved <laughs> in their visit. Maybe just a few. Yeah. yeah, they had a good time? Yeah, they had a great time. Good. I'm sure they'll be back. Good. So much more to see. Next time we'll get them on camera, you can do the uh, comparison. Hey. Does she look like your mom? Look like or her dad. My dad. Yeah. Anyhow, idea. thanks a lot for tuning in. Uh, Debbie back tomorrow. We'll see you then. Good night.